I praise God for this wonderful opportunity the Lord has given to me. And thank you, Dr. Johnny Moore, for the introduction. Praise God for the ministry that God is doing through the Samaritan Purse. Brother Ken, it was a privilege to meet you. I take this opportunity to say that I'm indeed grateful for Liberty University. Praise God for what the Lord is doing through this ministry. When I was a student at Liberty, Dr. Falwell would come and speak every Wednesday, and his subject will be, don't give up, don't quit. I thought he will have a different message next week. Same message, don't give up, don't quit. I, as an alumni of Liberty, I would say that Dr. Falwell was champion's champion. And I praise God for what he has done. I praise God for the life of Dr. Falwell, his vision, legacy of what God is doing today. I praise God for Mrs. Maisel Falwell. Just like Brother Ken said, I also praise God for the president of the university for giving us the opportunity to come and share during this missions week. I rejoice with you over the great progress the Lord is giving to this university. Love seeing Liberty excelling in every field. I thank you for sending Liberty University students in the month of January to visit some of our orphanages. We pray that you would continue to send them. I'm thankful for my friend Dr. Ron Godwin, Dr. Johnny Moore, Dr. Clayton King, and Dr. Duke Westover for their friendship over the years in my life. And praise God for the missionaries that we have representing different nations today. I come from a very small country, India. 1.2 billion people live in our country. In America, you have 373 million people. Well, that's how many cows we have at home. <laughs> 1.2 billion people, 16 major languages, 1,600 dialects. I've attended many missions conferences. In America, your country is known for a lot of information. I recently found out that the most unreached people group in our country uh, live in India, of all the places in the world. But when I graduated from Liberty University, I only knew of two people group, saved or lost. The people need to hear the name of Christ in our lifetime. The best statistics I've heard, two out of two die. The last time when I was at Liberty University, God has given us the new burden to start the ministry among the burned women who have been burned their husbands because they did not have the money to pay for the dowry. In the last 18 months, the Lord has helped us to rescue 358 women who have been burned, almost 85 percent, burned in their body. 270 of them have accepted Christ, and we praise God. The last statistics I got from India was 190 of them have died. We call this ministry Burn Ones Never Again. They have been burned by their husband in this life. But we have the glorious privilege to share gospel to them before they die, and they have eternity without fire. What a joy to know Christ who saves us for all eternity. I like to share this to the Liberty students that being a missionary is not a sacrifice. The greatest calling that God can give us is to be a missionary for His sake. What if the Prime Minister of India, Dr. Manmohan Singh, called me in his office and he says, would you please take a handwritten letter to the President of the United States of America? Guess what will happen? Number one, I will be on Fox News with Bill O'Reilly where the spin stops here. How about I will be on USA Today front page with a letter handwritten by the Prime Minister of India with my picture on the front page. And the title would be, What an Honor for an Indian to Come to White House with a handwritten letter of Prime Minister of India. But then all of a sudden, Jesus of Nazareth calls us into His service to take the love letter that He has written and take it to those who have never heard. We all of a sudden make it look like a sacrifice. Ho-hum, the greatest honor 
is to serve Christ and tell others what Christ has done. You're looking at a man this morning with 19 attempts of assassination. To me, Christ is real. I remember the day when I was a student here, we had 218 churches back home that Father started. And when I got back to India, started serving the Lord with my father since 1986. Today, the Ministry of Hope Givers has 49,384 churches established. To God be the glory for great things He hath done. I'd like to just share this with you. God doesn't need sissies. He doesn't need wimps. He didn't say pray to the Lord of the harvest to send forth loafers. He's looking for warriors who would say, for to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. I was in Dallas one time coming out of a radio station. I met Graham Staines, whose husband and her two boys were burned alive in the state of Orissa in India. I looked at Mrs. Staines and I said, Mrs. Staines, as an Indian, I want to say thank you for your sacrifice in the Lord's work. And I says, when a soldier of Australia dies, the flag in Sydney goes half-mast. When a soldier of, New, of India dies, the flag in New Delhi goes half-mast. But when the soldier of the cross dies, the flag in heaven never goes half-mast because heaven never loses a citizen. It always gains one. If there's one people group that I envy, I envy the martyrs. Three months ago, I had a surgery for removing cancer from my body. And I said to the Lord in the hospital, I said, Lord, you know I don't want to die of cancer. If there is a privilege that I would ever ask God for, I want to die a martyr in the nation of India. The reason today Hope Givers has 49,384 churches, it is not because of the Thomas's teaching. It is not because of the academic excellence of our Bible students. It is because of 17 men who have died in this ministry. The blood of martyrs are the seeds for new churches. I pray to God that God would call more students from Liberty University to be missionaries who would take the love letter of Christ to those who have never heard. I'm not here to give you a mission update. I'm here to see that God gives you a mission encounter. This is the Global Focus Week. I like to remind the students of Liberty University, missions is not just crossing the sea, it is seeing the cross. Turn them in your Bibles to book of Luke chapter 7. Book of Luke chapter 7. And by the way, while you turn there, I'm happy that our son Stephen Andrew Thomas is a student at Liberty University. <laughs> Praise God for, I told Johnny Moore, thank you for the mentorship that he is giving to him. Pray the Lord would raise him to be a soldier of the cross. Luke chapter 7, verse 36 through 50. If you have the right Bible, it's page 891. <laughs> verse 36. And one of the Pharisees desired that he would eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house, and he sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment. Trust the Spirit of God will bless the reading of His words to our hearts this morning. Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 50. Motivated by love. Most of us read Bible just so that we can tell others that we had a quiet time. Most of us like to be missionaries because we know we have flunked in every other field. Most of the people, they like to act like Christian because that is the coolest thing. But this morning I'd like to tell you what is your motive for serving Christ. The subject today we are going to study is motivated by love. There is no fear in love. To do what I'm doing today with all the attempts of assassination, pray that one day I do become a martyr. Till that day, what is the thing that keeps me going? I like what Paul said, it is the love of Christ that constraineth me to do this. 
One wonders why Simon the Pharisee would invite Jesus Christ into his house for a meal. Today, when we talk the term Pharisee, it almost talks about, we think about hypocrite. But in the times of Jesus, Pharisee was a good leadership position that you could get in the religious realm. Maybe the reason Pharisee asked Christ to come to his house for meal, maybe it was to treat Rabbi well was one of the privileges that you could have as a Pharisee. But this morning, I like to say that I'm glad he did. It was at Simon's house that our Lord taught one of his great lessons, one on the importance of the motivation of Christian life. The Bible tells us good numbers of motives for obeying and serving God. If you're writing, I'd like to encourage you to just note this down. There are certain motives that we have in the Bible. Motive number one, need to keep a clear conscience before God. The desire to, fit vest, to be a fit vessel for the noble cause for God to use us. The desire to receive blessings from God on our lives. The desire to see unbelievers come to Christ through our witness. The desire to avoid God's displeasure and discipline in our lives. The desire to see greater heavenly reward. The desire for a deeper walk with God. The desire for peace. The desire to do what God commands. But this morning, the greatest, the purest, most satisfying, and most God-glorifying desire is to please God and express our love for Him. Verse 36 to 38, we see the characters of this passage. Three main characters, of course there are many other mentioned, but three main characters that occupy this passage, Simon the Pharisee, Jesus, and the unnamed woman. Some Bible scholars believe that this is the same scene as Matthew chapter 14 verses 3 to 9, Matthew chapter 26, and John chapter 12. But it probably isn't. Luke mentions the word Pharisee three times in the first two verses, verse 36 and 37. The unknown woman wanders into his house where she finds herself before Christ. She's overcome and begins to weep, her tears falling at the feet of Jesus. Trying to make things better, she makes things worse. She lets down her hair, something no decent woman would do in public in the days of Christ. And she wipes Jesus' feet, kissing it all the while. Why is she doing all this? She's motivated by the love that she has for Christ. And finally, we read that she came to do exactly what she had planned. She anoints the Lord Jesus. Do you know what we observe when we read Luke chapter 7 verses 36 onwards, we are observing, we have a perfect picture of what it means for a person to enter the kingdom of God. We are witnessing an extravagant love of a forgiven sinner. I love the worship song written by Matt Redman, Redman. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you, Jesus. Students of Liberty, I pray that God would call you into full-time ministry, but before you even consider that, I'd like to ask you a question, what is your motivation for serving Christ? May the first and foremost motivation for you to serve Christ may be the love of Christ and love for Him. We also see in verse 39, please look at Luke chapter 7, verse 39. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw, he spake within himself, saying, what did he say? If he would have known who this person was, this lady was, he would not have let her touch him because she was a sinner. This man spoken like a Pharisee. I love Jesus Christ. He can read our mind. Did you know Satan cannot read our mind? Satan can read our words, he can read our works, and he can plant words into our mind, but he can never read our mind. Only Jesus of Nazareth can read our mind. In verse 39, the Pharisee did not say anything while this lady was worshiping at the feet of Jesus. And Jesus looked at him in verse 39 and he says, oh, he's talking to himself. He's wondering, how come I'm allowing this lady to worship me the way she's worshiping? You know, today, Christianity, we are, we are full of arrogance. We are full of ego. I know missionaries who serve Christ in other world, 
They never even leave the house, but they're on mission field. I know missionaries who never even have planted one church because they just do not love those people. The worship, the reason for us to worship Christ may be motivated by love. He was offended. This Pharisee was offended and embarrassed by the outward display of this woman's emotion. He placed the woman, this woman in a different category than himself. She was a sinner. My father, when he passed away, I remember this story on his funeral. A few years ago, before he passed away, my father asked me a question. Is there something, Samuel Thomas, you will not do? I said, yes. I will never, 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 ever baptize a leper. I should have never said that to him. As soon as I said that to him, he says, please take me to the airport. He had to go to Germany that day. On the way to the airport, we found out that the flight was six hours late. So he called one of the leper churches and he says, we are on our way. We'd like to have a meeting in your church today. And of course, I was driving him for 18 hours. So I said, Dad, you go and preach and I will sleep in the car because I have to drive back. I'll never forget after he finished his message, he came and knocked on my door and I was asleep. He said, Sam, 27 lepers have accepted Christ today, and they would like to follow the Lord in baptism, and I told them my son would be privileged to baptize them. I really wanted to kill my father, of course, with the love of Christ. <laughs> I baptized those 27 lepers. I will never forget, after the baptism, Dr. Johnny, I felt like there was numbness all over my body. I thought I was catching leprosy. I found out that day that there was not the problem with leprosy. Deep inside my heart, I just did not have the love of Christ. God had to break me. He broke me. Since that day, I had the privilege of baptizing over 2,700 lepers for the glory of God. To God be the glory for great things He had done. Look at the Pharisee's attitude about Jesus. Isn't that amazing when we don't like certain things in our life? Not only do we blame people, we blame God. The Pharisee said, number one, he did not like this unnamed woman coming into his house and just going crazy in worshiping Christ. And then he's questioning, maybe Christ is not the prophet. Look at them. One had a social high position in his society. And the other one was the social outcast. One was the host, and the other one was not even the invited guest. One was angry, the other one was overcome with joy. Only one believed that God had grace enough to forgive fallen, sinful people. The question this morning I'd like to ask the Liberty students, which one of them is more like you? Are you the Pharisee, or are you like the unnamed woman? Look at verse 40. Jesus answered. Did you see that? Pharisee did not even ask a question in verse 39. He was asking a question to himself. He did not ask Jesus. But I love Jesus. I love He's an awesome guy, by the way. Most of you like to read leadership book. I recommend you that you read the Bible. That's the greatest leadership book you'll ever find. Simon's real problem was his blindness. He could not see himself nor the woman, neither the Lord Jesus. The problem today is not the amount of sin in person's life, but the awareness of that sin in our hearts. Simon and woman were both sinners. Simon was guilty of nice sins, sins of the Spirit, especially the pride. I've known a lot of Christian missionaries who come to you with an attitude, if it wasn't for them, God would be broke. I've, I've known missionaries who say, well, Aren't you glad I serve Christ? What would Christ do without me? I like to tell such missionaries, he will surprise you. Pharisee was guilty of nice sins called pride. The unnamed woman was guilty of nasty sins, sins of the flesh. Her sins were known, while Simon's sins were hidden except from God. Both the women and the Pharisee were bankrupt and could not pay the debt to God. 
Simon was just spiritually bankrupt as much as the woman. He just did not realize it. Jesus looked at Simon, and he says, let me ask you this. If a man lends 500 pence to one and 50 pence to the other, both of them are not able to give the money back. Which one is forgiven more? Pharisee looks at Christ and he says, obviously the one who owed more is forgiven more. How was this woman saved? She repented and put her faith in Jesus Christ. How did she know that she was truly forgiven? She believed the word of Christ. What was the proof for her, for her salvation? Her love for Christ expressed a sacrificial devotion to him. For the first time, this lady found peace. The Bible says, if you look at it, verse 50, go into peace. He didn't say go in peace. He said go into peace. God and sinner are reconciled in this story. How did this woman know that she was forgiven? Jesus told her. How do we know today that we have been forgiven? God tells us in his word. Once you understand God's grace, you have no trouble receiving his free will and full forgiveness and rejoice in it. Verse 49, the people who are watching this show, they said, who is this man who is forgiving sins? This morning I like to say there are two kind of errors we must avoid when we read this passage. We must not conclude that this woman was saved by her tears and her gifts. Jesus made it very clear that it was her faith alone that saved her. We must not think that the lost sinners are saved by love, either God's love for them or their love for God. Because when we study John chapter 3 verse 16, God loves the whole world in the same sense, yet the whole world is not saved. Sinners are saved and always been saved by the grace of God. For by grace are we saved. Grace is not is the love that pays the price, and the price was paid on the cross. Jesus did not reject neither the tears or the gift of this lady. Her work were evidence of her faith in Jesus. Faith without works is dead. Ladies and gentlemen, we are not saved by faith plus works. We are saved by faith that leads to work. As I conclude this passage today, turn with me to Galatians chapter 5 and verse 6. Galatians chapter 5, verse 6. And in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. A few years ago, I had the privilege of preaching in a central jail in India. One of the ladies after the message came to me and to my father. She said, Mr. Thomas, I'm not afraid of this jail in India. I'm not afraid of the policemen. I'm not afraid of the sticks that they carry around to beat the prisoners. I'm not afraid to sleep on this concrete floor without any mattress. I'm not afraid to live in this jail and eat this dirty food that they give us. She looked at me and my father, she says, would you please answer one question for me? A few years ago, I delivered a baby girl. In India, if you give birth to a baby girl, you're a cursed woman. Because the lowest reincarnation is to be born as a woman in India. She looked at us and said, well, when I delivered the baby girl, my husband did not like that I could not give him a boy. So he asked me to kill my own baby girl. I squeezed the neck of my baby girl. And when I squeezed the neck of that baby girl, those two little eyes were looking at me. Mr. Thomas, when I sit in this jail, when I eat this food, when I use the restroom, when I walk around this jail, those two eyes are looking at me. Who can deliver me from the guilt of sin? We had the privilege of sharing Jesus Christ with her that day. She accepted Jesus Christ as her Savior and Lord. 
For the first time, just like this unnamed woman, she experienced peace in her life. Today, I'd like to tell you, we have helped her to get out of jail. She's the wonderful trophy of grace. She's preaching Christ in Kerala. Over 79 churches have been established because of her witness. Those who have been forgiven the most will love him the most. My question today, have you been forgiven? Do you know what it means to be forgiven of sins? I hear people all the time, oh, I love the people of Africa. I love the people of India. Well, it sounds good, but that's phony. You must first love Christ. Once you love him, then he will give you the love for those people you never had love for. I pray that the Lord God of the Bible would raise champions from Liberty University who would be in so much love with Jesus and who will say to the Lord, Lord, wherever you lead me, I'll follow. Wherever you take me, I'll go. Whatever things you want me to do, even if you want me to do, be a martyr for you, I will do it because of my love for you. Let's bow our heads. Heads about and eyes are closed. No one looking around. Which one are you? Are you like the Pharisee who would sit in the worship and question how others worship? Or will you be like this unnamed woman who say, Lord, I come to you. You have forgiven me the most. I don't care what the world thinks of me. I want to weep at your feet. I want to kiss your feet. I want to wipe your feet. I want to anoint your feet. How many of you say, Lord, since you have forgiven me the most, take me to the uttermost part of the world. Father in heaven, we thank you for this university. Thank you for its impact around the world. Thank you for what this university means to me personally. Continue to bless them. Lord, I pray that more students from this Bible college, from this university, from the seminary, would go out as missionaries for you, only for one reason, because they have been motivated by the love for you. In Jesus' name, amen.